so I'd like to bring him up and I'd like the Benedictus group to come on up and pray over Orlando. <clears throat> Deacon Jim, could you lead us in prayer? Lord God, let's, let's all extend our hands to thank you. Lord God, we just come before you in humility. We pray over this young man, Lord Jesus, who is going to pour out his heart to us today and tell us his journey in life that has brought him to this point. So we ask, Lord God, for the power of the Spirit to come upon him. Just give him a double portion of, of that strength. Let his words be your words. Let his words be teaching words and healing words. We pray all this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow. There's a lot of people in this room. <laughs> My friend Nina said, uh, you should eat. You should feed those butterflies. I said, no, you don't want to feed these butterflies. <laughs> I'm so honored that uh, Deacon Finn invited me here and the Benedictus group allowed me to come today. I do have butterflies, so allow me to help uh, relieve those butterflies by sharing you a little joke. <laughs> Once upon a time, there were these uh, three CIA recruits. They were about to get in. They were, went through about three years of training. They just needed one more test before they were included into the agency. So they're Instructor brought each one of them into the room individually and said, okay, got one more test. You pass this test and you're in. Here's a gun, push it forward. Your wife's in the other room, now shoot her. <laughs> the first guy goes, what? My wife? I'm not gonna shoot my wife, I love my wife. He leaves. The second guy comes into the room, same story. You're almost done, pass this test and you're in. Here's a gun, your wife's in the other room, now shoot her. Grabs the gun, he walks into the room. He's in there for a couple of minutes and he walks out, he's weeping. He says, I really thought I wanted this job, but I love my wife, can't shoot my wife. He leaves. The last recruit is a female. Same story, sits down, the, the instructor says, one more test and you're in. Here's a gun, husband's in the other room. Shoot him. She grabs the gun, walks in the room, slams the door, bam, bam, bam. All of a sudden, there's this utter silence, and then this wrestling match happens. She, there's furniture flying everywhere. He walks in, and she's got a chair above her head, slamming it on his head. Guy goes, what are you doing? She goes, there were blanks in the gun. I had to finish the job. <laughs> <laughs> stories. I love stories. Stories have the ability to make people laugh. Stories have the ability to inspire people to live lives beyond ordinary. Stories have the ability to paint a picture. And today I want to paint a picture of you, for you, a picture of what God has been doing in my life. It's a story of how God moved me from being a man's man to being a God's man. There's some people here in this room that know me already, but there's a lot more that don't. So allow me to give you an idea of who I am. I consider myself to be the man of many hats and a lot of props. The first hat that I wear is husband and father. I'm a husband to my beautiful bride, Beth. Now, she's not a redhead, but I just take whatever toys my kids leave lying around. My wife, she is the rock of our marriage. If it wasn't for her, I don't think I'd be standing here today. So, I thank her for that. I'm father to two adorable kids. My first son is junior, or my first kid is junior. He's like a penguin. He just waddles around without a care in the world. When he was born, we thought, wow, this kid is so easy. He hardly ever cries. I think we should have four of them. <laughs> now, my daughter. She is my princess. She is my angel. She is my patience tester. <laughs> when she was about two years old, she picked up a bat, a plastic bat, and she 
hit her brother in the head with it. And then she dropped it, shrugged her shoulder and says, what? It wasn't me. <laughs> As a profession, I am a bookkeeper and tax preparer. In a nutshell, my clients come to me with books that look like this, and I make it nice and neat. The third hat that I wear is author. My itty bitty white hat. <laughs> author of the book, God Made Me Pick Up Underwear, Finding Faith in Unusual Places. Now I gotta correct you, it's not God made me pick up my underwear, I do that. Now my kids on the other hand, God needs to tell them to do that. Now you might wonder, where do you get a title like that? Well, when I began my faith journey, I actively sought the voice of God. I used to pray, I said, God, please talk to me. I want to hear your voice. Then one day I was in the parking lot and there was a piece of trash on the ground. And God said, Orlando, pick that up. Now, it wasn't a booming voice. It wasn't James Earl Jones or Morgan Freeman. No, it was a tapping on my heart. I thought for a second, God, is that you? If it is you, then I'm going to be obedient and I'm going to pick it up. If it's not you, then I'm going to pick it up anyway and make the world a little cleaner. After that day, I walked out and I thought, wow, God talked to me. That's awesome. A couple of months later, I prayed it again. I said, God, I liked it the way you talked to me that time. Talk to me again. Again, I'm in a parking lot, and God said, you see all those stray shopping carts? I said, put them all away. I look, I said, God, someone gets paid to do that. Do you really want me to do that? Again, I thought, if it is you, God, then I'm going to be obedient. If it's not you, then I'm just going to help somebody get their job done a little easier. A couple of months later, I prayed it again. I said, God, I really love the way you talk to me. Your servant is listening. Talk to me again. That day, I walked out of the gym, again in a parking lot. And I parked to the right, but for some reason, I veered to the left. And on the ground was underwear. And I immediately looked up at God and said, God, that's different. <laughs> I am not picking up someone's draws. <laughs> and I walked away. Started heading back to my car. And then God stopped tapping on my heart. Instead, God reached and grabbed my heart. And he said these profound words. He said, Orlando, I hear your prayers. I hear that you want to be used by me. And honestly, I will. But before I can entrust you with the bigger things, I got to see if I can entrust you with the smaller things. And to those profound words, I got the underwear. But I went to the car first to get a plastic bag because it's still, it's still underwear. <laughs> and God definitely would increase the asks of me. He would slowly ask me to pray for complete strangers, share my stories to others, and eventually pen my story. It's a story of how God showed himself to me. Now, these hats, nice, pretty, and colorful. But I wasn't always a man of these hats. See, I was once a man of much darker hats. I wore the hat of a workaholic, working 60 plus hours a week, trying to make the money to buy the things that the world said you had to have, that were supposed to make you happy, but didn't. I would work so much, I would work eight hours, come home, have a little bit to eat with the family, and then get right back to work. My wife always reminds me that when she gave birth to our first child, right out the door, I was making phone calls, making my next appointments. Whenever we would go on vacation, I'd bring a box with me, just like this, filled with work. I, I would enjoy vacation with them, but right when they went to sleep, I went right back to work. I also wore the hat of a binge drinker. Now, I've always been goal-oriented. So when I drank, I got, to get, I got drank to get drunk. There wasn't one drink, two drinks. There's a saying, one drink, one tequila, two tequila, three tequila floor. That, that was me. One was never enough. 
And I drink because when I drink, something changed. I became a little more lively. My, my cousins used to egg me on. They used to say, Happy Lando comes out when you drink. Come on, let's see Happy Lando. And so I would drink. And I felt like I was the life of the party. And I might have been, but not to my wife. You see now, not only was she watching two young children, she had to take care of a third child, me, because I was too inebriated to take care of myself. The third hat that I wore, the darkest of hats that I wore, was a man addicted to pornography. It was an addiction that I began when I was eight years old, and it was an addiction that would grow for about 24 years. As the material became more and more available, so did the height of my addiction. It got to a point where I would have thousands and thousands of movies downloaded on my computer, and I'd watch them in the morning, in the afternoon, and when everyone was asleep. It was never enough. And because of all these dark and ugly hats that I once wore, it wasn't a surprise that my marriage was falling apart. You see, my wife wanted to communicate with me. She wanted to know what was on my heart. She wanted to know me, and she would always sit and ask me, what's on your mind? And of course, I could never tell her what was on my mind, because what was on my mind was work, was drinking. Gambling, that was another dark hat that I wore, and pornography. So, of course, I would always say, nothing's on my mind, and I would usually just sit in front of her with utter silence. The less and less we talked, the farther and farther we grew apart. There were many times that we would look at each other and wonder, why are we even together? So, what got me from wearing these dark these dark and ugly hats to these now bright and colorful hats. I met God. On August 14, 2007, God became more than a figment of my imagination. God shined His light so brightly upon me that I knew He was real. You see, I knew I was having some trouble in my marriage, and I knew it was my fault. And I wanted to fix it, just didn't know how. And they don't teach it in school. So the first place I went was self-help books. They did help. They taught me how to love myself more, but they didn't, that didn't relate to loving my wife more. And at this time, in this season of my life, when I was searching, I had some physical ailments. I had a, some lower back pain, and I was visiting a chiropractor on a weekly basis. And when I would go see him, I noticed something about him. His name was Dr. Matt. And he lived differently. He lived an extraordinary life, and that extraordinary life grabbed my attention. There's the words from St. Francis the Assisi, preach the gospel always, and if necessary, use words. The way he lived his life grabbed my attention, and I wanted to know more about how he got there. I later came to find out that he held a prayer group every 5 a.m. on Tuesday mornings, and I thought, wow, you guys wake up at 5 a.m. morning to pray? Searching for answers myself, I asked him, hey, can I come? He said, you're always welcome. So I show up to his house on August 14. There's just a bunch of guys surrounding his, uh, his house. I'm thinking, are we going to pray outside? Are we going in yet? One of the guys says, no, no, one of our Christian brothers is in trouble and we need to go help him out. I said, all right, got nothing better to do, it's 5 a.m. <laughs> Next thing you know, this limo pulls up right in front of us and it's my chiropractor. And he says, get in. I'm thinking, wow, this guy is blessed. <laughs> <laughs> I get into the limo, there's three TVs, he's blasting Christian music, and I'm thinking, I think I'm paying my chiropractor way too much money. <laughs> so we get to um, John Maurer's house. There's guys just drinking coffee, nothing out of the ordinary. I thought maybe someone was sick or some domestic violence or something like that. Nothing like that. All the guys circle around. We started with a little prayer. 
all of a sudden, it's revealed to me that there's some spiritual activity going on in the house. I'm thinking to myself, okay, God, this is my very first one, and you're throwing me into an exorcism? Really? You see, the owner's wife has felt a present pushing down on her body. They would smell sulfur around the house, and the dogs would bark uncontrollably. Now, did I see any of that? No. But I didn't have to, because I can honestly tell you that I was a chicken. <laughs> My wife, whenever she would hear a noise outside, she would say, hey, honey, there's a noise outside. Go check it. And I would say, no, I'm not going to check it. And of course, she would get so tired of my cowardice, she would go down there instead. And of course, I would be the husband. I'd follow behind her with my stick. I wouldn't go first, but I would follow her. <laughs> so I didn't have to see it. I heard it, and that was enough for me. And I thought about leaving, but I couldn't because I didn't drive there. I rode in the limo. And I'm glad I didn't because what I would see next would be so profound. I saw men praying. I'm not just saying a, a prayer prayer. No, these guys prayed with power. These guys prayed with a zeal. These guys prayed in the name of Jesus Christ. I was so moved with what I watched. I felt like I just watched Spider-Man for the very first time. And now I wanted to get bit by that radioactive spider. There was a power in there that I wanted. I pulled John Moon aside and I said, John, what was that all about? I want to know more about that. How did you demonstrate all that power. He said, that all that was was the Holy Spirit. I said, can I have that? He said, yes, you can. All we have to do is pray over you and allow the Holy Spirit to come upon your life and let him lead. I said, okay, give it to me. And so we're in the limo at this time, and he opens the door and says, hey, this guy wants the Holy Spirit. Five guys pile into the limo to pray over me. And they all just pray that the Holy Spirit would come and lead my life. And after that moment, I felt so empowered. I was driving home and I can't wait to tell my wife. Oh man, I'm so excited. Now, I got to ask you guys this question. Have you ever been so excited about something that you couldn't tell your wife that the moment you see her, you throw up all over her? <laughs> I did. <laughs> I told her I was giving my life up to Christ. I told her everything that I saw and she looked at me she rolled her eyes, said, whatever. She gave me this look that said, don't tell me, show me. But I knew there was something different inside of me. I could feel it. And from that moment on, I was so hungry for the Word of God. I took my Bible that was collecting dust off my bookshelf, and I just started devouring it, reading word after word. And all of a sudden, this word that was that used to put me to sleep was giving me life. I started downloading message after message of the pastors that these guys had been attending and I was just eating it all up. Within one week, I sent out an email to all my friends and family. I told them of my aha moment, the moment I met God, that I was giving my life up to Christ and I was throwing away the things that led me to sin. Pornography, gambling, and drinking. And of course, with an email like that, you're going to get some pokes. And one of my friends said, hey, Orlando, I think somebody hijacked your computer. <laughs> he said, if you were throwing your porn away, you should have just given it to me. But that's just boys being boys. The funny thing, my mom called me. She says, honey, I'm glad you gave your life to Christ, but did you have to say pornography in your email? You might get arrested. <laughs> I know my mom's prayers really helped bring me to this point. But I was so bold in my confession because I had, I had finally learned what it meant when Christ gave his life up for me. The least I could do was be a little embarrassed about my situation. And because of this new hunger for God, I just started devouring everything I could find about God. And I started sharing what I learned in emails, personal conversations with friends, just evangelizing, doing what Christ told us to do, until all of a sudden, I hit a roadblock. The roadblock was my wife. She wanted me to stop. She wanted me to stop all the evangelizing. You see, I thought that if I just become super spiritual, 
my marriage would just get fixed? She said, no, no, Orlando, our house is still broken. I couldn't accept that right away because I felt this call from God to do it and I thought my wife was holding me back. So I had to take it to prayer. I said, God, I know you're leading me in this direction. Open my wife's eyes so she could see. But what God did was he opened my eyes. He said, look, Orlando, I'm going to use you. But you've got to get your house fixed. You've got to get your house in order. There's a couple of trees that are blocking you from being the witness that I want you to be. Take care of those trees and then I'll use you. Those three trees were an addiction of pornography, marital strife, and financial struggles. You see, when I first gave my life to Christ, I went cold turkey. I no longer needed to look at those images that once satisfied me. I thought I was free because I was hungering so much for God. That was until one day I was sitting in front of my computer just cleaning out my, you know, organizing pictures and I found a video that I had hid. I didn't delete it all. And at that moment I prayed, God, give me the strength to delete this. And then I sat there and I stared at it. I stared at that icon, stared at it until I finally opened it up. And for that moment I was satisfied. But right after that, I grieved. I grieved to God. I said, God, why did I fall to this? I thought I was saved. I thought I was free of this. Please give me the tools to break this. I guess it's harder than I thought it was. He would. He would open the door. He, re he opened the door to this one book called Every Man's Battle by Stephen Arterburn. And the first thing this book taught me, taught me that I was an addict. And as an addict, I realized the battle was going to be harder than I thought. This book taught me a couple of things also, like how to bounce my eyes. The book taught me that, yes, you can enjoy the beauty of a woman, but you have to bounce your eyes quickly before your visions go beyond the beauty of a woman. The book also taught me that I needed to cut off the things that led me to stray. Adult bookstores magazines, uh, strip clubs. He said, those are off, those are off, can't go to those anymore. I said, okay, I can do that. And I was walking in freedom for a couple of months. I thought, oh, I'm strong in the Lord. I can, I, this, thing is, this thing is defeated in my life. And I could avoid those places that the book said to avoid, but what I couldn't avoid was my mailbox. You see that Victoria's Secret magazine that came every few months? I couldn't stop it from getting into my mailbox. The first time it came in, I took it and I just threw it in the trash. The second time it came in the mail a couple of months later, I, I opened it up, ah, oh, there's no power over me, get behind me Satan, I said, and I threw it in the trash. The third time it came in the mail, I devoured it. I looked at every single page and later that led me to go back onto the internet and look at every single video I once watched a long time ago. Again, satisfied for the moment. But thereafter, I just grieved. God, I says, God, this battle is harder than I thought. How many times are you going to forgive me? Please give me the tools. That following Tuesday, I went to the prayer group and I told them of my struggle. And all the men understood. It's a battle that all men fight. But they prayed over me that the Holy Spirit would give me the strength. And right after that prayer, a new guy came up to me and says, Hey, I, I'm dealing with the same struggle, but I found this thing that helped me out. It was a, it was a course called Setting Captives Free. And I have all the resources I mentioned in, the, in a flyer outside. But Setting Captives Free, it's a 60-day biblical approach to breaking the addiction of pornography. And I think this course is what really gave me the tools to really set me free. One of the main tools it taught me was how to run. You see, when Joseph encountered Potiphar's wife, he didn't sit with her and say, no, I don't think I should do what you want me to do. No, he didn't try to reason with her. He ran away as quickly as possible. And I look at that one moment in time when I fell to sin, it was because I sat there and I almost had a conversation with the devil, like, 
eh, I'm not going to watch it. Oh, I'm going to watch it. I'm not going to watch it. Eventually, if you stay there too long, you can be overpowered. The second tool I learned was to cut off the things that open the doors that planted the seed of lust in your life. I've now learned how to cut the cable off my TV. Some of you might think, well, that's going overboard. I'm not a prude or anything. I let my kids watch TV. But we can watch a movie we get from the library or Redbox, and they can watch the same movie a hundred times and they're satisfied. I also cut the data plan off my phone, another doorway for inappropriate material to grab hold of me. I mean, all I really need is text and answering the phone. And not only be because I cut that off, now I get to actually be with my family, not have my kids play on the side and browse, I'll do what you need to do, I'm playing on my phone. I was able to now enjoy my wife and my kids a lot more because I did that. And I also put filters on all my computers, filters that stop me from attempting to look at inappropriate material and then it sends an email to my accountability partners telling them, hey, you need to check up on Orlando. Because it's important that we have accountability. It's hard to do this battle alone. And I got a couple of my friends that are here today that are my accountability partners and I thank you. But my number one accountability partner is my wife. Because honestly, she cracks a harder whip. Because I want to be free, I gave her the access to ask me that question. Are you doing okay? Do you have any struggles? And what's awesome about her is she allows me to be truthful. Because if, if I do fall in that trap, if I don't say anything, it grows inside of me. But the moment I can reveal it to her, the moment that seed dies. Now some people might think, going a little overboard, you don't need to do all that stuff. What about self-control? I don't know about you, but if, you, if I was going on a diet and you put a pumpkin pie in front of me, I'm eating that pumpkin pie. I also learned that if I know myself and I know my enemy, the battle is easier to win. One of the greatest military strategists, Sun Tzu, once said, if you know yourself and you know your enemy, you can withstand a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not your enemy, for every victory, you'll suffer a defeat. If you know not yourself, and you know not your enemy, you'll succumb in every battle. I did one of these talks a year ago, and one of the guys came up to me and says, I don't need to do all that, I've got self-control. He also admitted to me that he had over like thousands of people on his Facebook post, a lot of them were girls. He said, Self-control, I don't need to do all that. I just found out that he's getting a divorce. He met a girl on Facebook. He's leaving his wife and kids. You see, Christ didn't call us to be Christians. Christ called us to be disciples. And the root word of disciple is discipline. And the, most, the more disciplines I place in my life, the easier it is to walk the straight a narrow path. Because broad is the road and wide is the gate that leads to destruction and many men find it. I know I did. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. But many, very few men find it. But now that I've tasted that life, I don't want the broad road and that's why I put disciplines in place. Now I told you that I made my wife my accountability partner. That wasn't an easy thing to do. But it wasn't until I took down the tree of marital strife that I was able to allow her into my heart. How many men deal with marital strife? <laughs> I've got a joke. Once upon a time there was a husband and a wife that went to go see a counselor. They go to the counselor's office, and the wife is immediately saying, da, 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 da. It's his fault. He doesn't listen. He doesn't hear me. He doesn't 
know my heart. And he's just sitting there quiet with his hands on his lap while she's just egging him on. The therapist realizes what the problem is and he goes up to the woman and he takes her by the face and he starts kissing her. Not just a kiss, but he's kissing her. While the while the husband's just looking at that like, huh? <laughs> she sits her down and the woman is utterly silent. Counselor says, did you see that? Did you see what I did? That's all your wife needs. If you were to just give her that three times a week, your marriage would improve. <laughs> Counselor said to the husband, do you think you can do that? He goes, yeah. I can bring her to you on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. <laughs> Marital strife. The marital strife in my house was due to a lot to do with the hurt that I imposed upon my wife. And it also was the lack of communication. You see, at this stage in our life, the only form of communication we had was fighting. That's the only time we communicated because we never could see eye to eye. And so my wife thought, let's go see a counselor. She wanted to see a Catholic counselor and I agreed upon it. And I'm glad she did because not only did the counselor open my eyes and help us fix our marriage, but she also answered the questions I had about the Catholic faith. Because at this time I wasn't Catholic yet. But I'll tell you that story in a little bit. And I'm glad we went to counseling. So if you guys are thinking about counseling, I highly recommend it. It really is nice to have a referee. Someone that can see both sides. Because she really taught us how to communicate one another. And by the grace of God, within one year, our counselor said, you know what, I don't say this to too many couples, but you don't need me anymore. You are so willing to work on your marriage, do the things, come to every counseling session, and read books outside of this, I can honestly say you guys can go. <laughs> the funny story is, about eight months into our therapy, me and my wife used to pick fights with each other in the car, just so we get our money's worth going to therapy. <laughs> But that came from realizing where the problems were and then reading books on learning how to communicate. One of the key things that I learned was how my wife receives love. Women need love, but most men don't know how to give it. And as a man, I receive love through respect. And most women don't understand that. So if I highly recommend any book, pick up the book Love and Respect. It really teaches both husband and wife how to give what each other really need. So now that we're doing this, our marriage is going up another level until another roadblock. You see, I noticed my faith was growing about 100 miles per hour. And my wife was trickling along about 15 miles per hour. And now that I had this newfound love for my wife, I didn't want to leave her behind. I wanted her by my side. And I prayed, God, why is my wife falling behind? Our marriage is getting better. He revealed to me, Orlando, it's because you're in a divided house. You see, at this time, I was Protestant, and my wife was Catholic. I mean, I was born Catholic, raised Catholic, ma married in a Catholic church, but I didn't come to faith at a Catholic church. I came to faith at a Protestant church, and that's where I wanted my faith to grow. And so I said, oh God, if you don't want us to be in a divided house, make my wife Protestant. <laughs> That's not what he did. You see, it was my constant prayer. It was, God, please open my wife's eyes to the errors of the Catholic Church. What he did instead was he opened my eyes to what's right about the Catholic Church. It was my constant prayer that God would light this fire upon my wife's heart for him. What he did was he said, stop blowing out her flames. See, every time you crush the Catholic Church, you're stomping on her spirit. It was my constant prayer that God would utilize me for the building of his kingdom. He said, Orlando, I'll do that if you'll let me do it in the Catholic Church. I had a hard time with that. Protestants have, we have a lot of doctrines that we don't really agree with in the Catholic Church, so I couldn't grab hold of that idea real quickly. I just kept taking it to prayer. God revealed these profound words. He said, look, Orlando, I could use you in a Protestant church. 
and you could be a flame within a fire. Or I could put you in the Catholic Church and allow you to be a spark where there needs to be a fire. And to those words, I knew exactly what I had to do. And on April 20th, 2011, I was confirmed in the Catholic Church. And because of the obedience to God in that ray, God opened up so many more doors, more doors that I could even think about. He opened the door for my marriage to grow up a hundredfold, spiritually, which is the most important thing you need in a marriage. He also opened the door for me to serve because I had a heart to serve. But those doors were closed because you can't really serve if you go to two different churches. And the moment I was confirmed, Everybody wanted me to be a part of their ministry. The Eucharistic minister, they wanted me to teach, they wanted me to um, be a lectern. But I, I learned that there are certain gifts that God gave me, and I also have to learn how to say no, otherwise it'll take me away from the ministry at home. So the things I now do are uh, ushering and greeting at the door. And I also teach, teach eighth grade education, teach eighth grade religious ed, which I so love my kids. I have so much of a heart to teach because these kids walk in the door after, what, six years, seven years of Catholic education, and they don't know what the first book of the Bible is. That's a shame. And God has shown me that if I can teach them how to know Christ in the most intimate of ways, then it'll help grow a generation. And because of my obedience in there, He also opened or actually gave me the ability to take down the third tree, financial struggles. You see, in 2009, only two years into my faith, I became a statistic. I became one of the millions and millions unemployed. For 20 years I was working. Never been unemployed before. I didn't know what that was like. For those who are there now, for those who have ever been there in your lifetime, you know it's not an easy place to be. It's not easy telling your wife I can't buy you the things that you once liked. It's not easy telling her that she needs to pick up the slack. It's not easy hearing from her that you need to pick up the slack. It's true. The Bible says that if you don't work, you don't eat. But it still hurts hearing that from your wife. And it hurts telling your wife you don't know where you're going to live in a year. But because of God's amazing grace, and because of this season in my life, I got to see the gift of family and friends. You see, my mom and dad, they're always willing to give me a helping hand, cover our groceries, give us a little spending cash, and I just thank God for those loving parents. And then in 2009, I saw the most amazing blessing in Christmas. You see, me and my buddies, we would always get together for Christmas and exchange gifts between the spouses and the kids. That means I would have to buy four gifts to exchange. We didn't have the money for that. I texted my friend Eric and I said, Eric, we're going to come to the Christmas party. We'll be there. But we're going to have to leave early. We just can't afford gifts right now. It's such a blessing what he texted me back. He said, Orlando, we've been friends way too long. You've always had my back. Don't you ever think I won't have yours? Christmas is taken care of. Later on in the week, he took me out to lunch and he, he passed me an envelope. Over $300 of cash and gift cards. More than enough. I thank Eric for that. Just sitting right there. Thank you, Eric. I also saw a blessing in new friends. You see, because of my unemployment, I had a lot of time. So now I became the one who dropped the kids off at school. And because I was the one dropping off the, school, the kids off at school, I got to meet the parents and get to know them a little better. One of the guys I met, he was going through the same thing. We both lost our jobs, so we got to hang out and talk a little bit and get to know each other better and share our struggles. and. 
lift each other up. And because of that new friend, I really learned what the words mean. That iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. This man sharpened me at that time in my life, and he continues to sharpen me today. He's sitting right here, Luis. Thank you, Luis, for that. I just thank God for all these amazing things, all these things that He's opened up to me. But still, we were still struggling financially. We were still about to lose our house. But where my wife and I were, we could have wavered. We could have held back what we gave to the church. We had decided a long time ago that we wouldn't. We had decided that we would build God's house first, and he would build our house. And because of the obedience there financially, just recently I saw some more of his amazing grace. You see, I just looked at my year-to-year -year numbers from last year to this year. My business has grown over 111%. And because of the increase of income I've now had, the bank was willing to take a look at my loan. We just received a letter last month saying, we'll give you a loan modification. We don't have to lose our house. We don't need to look for another place to live. To God be the glory. It's amazing what God has done in my life. But it wasn't until I took down those trees. And I want to tell you, how do I took down those trees? I did it with a sharp axe. Abraham Lincoln once said, if I were given six hours to chop down a tree, I would spend six, four hours sharpening my axe. So I do that on a weekly basis, a daily basis. But it looks like I'm running out of time, so allow me to wrap things up. I told you guys where I am today in this bright and colorful hats. Showed you where I once was in these dark and ugly hats. Allow me to finish up by telling you where I plan to be. I'm going to do that by reading you my eulogy. Now, my eulogy isn't where I am today, but it's what I aspire to be remembered as. So allow me to say it to you in a voice of a friend. Today we lay to rest an extraordinary man, a man on fire for God. Today we lay to rest the man of many hats. He wore the hat of husband. He wore the hat of father. But the hat that I so enjoyed the most was the hat of friendship to me. His life was contagious and I wanted to be like him only because he regarded his role model was Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. I know we're going to miss him. But don't you worry, I have no doubt that he's standing in front of the Almighty Father hearing these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with the little things I have given you. I now entrust you with more. Welcome into the kingdom of your Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen.